the next verse where he talks about how I wish everybody was like me, single. And it almost sounds like the idea of marriage is a concession, but everybody ought to be celibate. But I don't think that's what it means, and I, I know there are many others who agree that really he is connecting this idea um, with the previous verses. That's this, this idea of staying apart by mutual consent for a short period of time is really a concession of Paul's. He really has a high regard of marriage, as it turns out. Well, anyway, so he goes on, I wish that all people were just like me, but each has his own gift from God, one this and another that. I say to the unmarried and to widows, it's good for them if they remain as I am. But if they do not have self-control, they should marry, for it's better to marry than burn with desire. So Paul is acknowledging that there is a, a gift of being single, and there's a gift of being married. Now, Paul, as an apostle, was called to be single. And the, if he had been married, being an apostle, it would have been very difficult for him because he was traveling all the time. Imagine all those difficult journeys that he took, including the shipwrecks and all that kind of stuff, with a wife and little kids. I mean, that would have been horrible. His, his mind would have been so focused on protecting his family that he would have not been able to focus so much on this very, very, very important mission that God had him on. Um, all the stonings that he underwent, all the, the, uh, the difficulties. But it doesn't mean that singleness is more holy. And that was one of the things that the Corinthians were, were feeling. So Paul's word is kind of, if you're called, if you feel a strong calling of God on your life, to be single so that you can devote yourselves to a particular mission or job that God has called you to to further His kingdom, then that's great. Make sure you have that calling. Because if you don't, get married. It's the norm. In other words, don't just think that being single is the way that you should go because I am that way. So then verse 10, he says, I command the married, not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to leave her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to leave his wife. So here's where we come into more of the easy parts of, the, of this passage to interpret. Come on, you guys, you're supposed to laugh there. <laughs> now I want you to understand as we go through this that good people disagree as to how to interpret this passage of Scripture, okay? So I'm going to give you what uh, my best sense of it and when uh, the reading that I've done on it and the, the reading of the Scripture in light of the context. So just take it for that, I'm, I'm, and I am open to other opinions. So, that having been said, um, I want to again set a context here of what Paul is dealing with. He's trying to fight two tendencies in the church. One of those tendencies, as we've seen, as we've read through Corinthians, is kind of the what happens in the body stays in the body kind of a thing. You know, the, the, the spirit's good, the body's bad, but we're going to slough off these bodies. So we can basically do anything we want in our bodies here on earth, and we'll be fine because we're going to go to heaven and everything will be good there. The second one is the idea of that the... Uh, Flesh is bad, and so we need to just give up on anything physical in this body altogether. Um, the, um, that's what we would call an ascetic point of view. And it's that physical relations and even marriage itself was somehow wrong and somehow fleshly. And um, so the tendency was, apparently, in that particular context, for some of the women in the church to want to divorce their husbands, to be more holy, to be, to be more ascetic and, and pure before the Lord, because flesh is bad. And Paul basically, very bluntly says, don't. Don't be divorcing your husbands. And then he also says, and guys, by the way, don't be divorcing your wives. But in the, in the society... Um, the men really had all the control. They could just say, you know, woman, you're out of here. And especially in the Hebrew culture, you know, it was, you burned dinner, honey, so I'm going to write you a certificate of divorce. And, and uh, that was really changed in the context of the church. There is neither male nor female. And so some of the women apparently were thinking, well, I'm going to be more holy, so I'm going to divorce my husband. And, and uh, Paul says, don't do it. And he says, this is what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 7. 
And, and way back into Leviticus, I mean, God created marriage and God wants people to stay married. Marriage, I heard somebody say this recently, I really like this. Marriage is like glue. Living together is like Velcro. <laughs> I kind of like that, that picture. Um, when two people are glued together, just as two surfaces are glued together, in the parts that are joined by the glue, there's actually a chemical change. Uh, the glue actually, uh, uh, on a molecular level, changes the consi consistency and the nature and makeup of the, the edges of the two surfaces that are bound together. And uh, so they are put together to stay, and if you know what happens if you've got a strong bond of glue, something together, when you pull those pieces apart, what happens? It destroys the bond and, and mars both of the surfaces that were pulled apart. And that's what happens uh, in marriage. God never intended for two people to get married and then get um, divorced. It is God's best. And so Paul's word is, do whatever you can to stay married. It's important. Uh, it's also important, you know, because um, as Paul will, will write in the, the letter to the Ephesians, marriage is a picture. Marriage is, you know, glorifying God in your body, reflecting the character of Christ out into a dark world to bring more people into the kingdom of God. Your marriage actually can be a picture of the love of God for His, the love of Christ for His church. And that picture can actually bring people into the kingdom of God. Your marriage preaches the gospel without you speaking a word. So it is important on a number of levels. Now, that having been said, Paul realized that he was talking to people that were broken, just like all of us are, living in a broken world. And the reality was that not everybody would be willing or able to stay married. And so he tells the women and, and also the men, he said, okay, if you're going to go ahead and divorce them anyway, you got two options. Stay unmarried or be reconciled to this person. So the question comes to us then, well, okay, does that mean then if you have ever divorced, then you should never get remarried and the church should never remarry people who have been divorced? And there are large branches of Christendom for whom that is the reality. If you've ever been divorced, then they will never, uh, they will never marry you again. Now, I don't actually agree with that, and I don't have a long time, because we're already running late, uh, to get into the reasons, but here's my take on it, and that is if a couple has tried their best, but it's failed. For it could be for a variety of reasons, or perhaps maybe if there was abuse in the marriage, um, and they realize the failure. It's not just they're being cavalier about it. Oh, you know what? I didn't like the way he made the bed in the morning, or didn't, and left his socks on the floor, so this marriage is over. Besides, there's this guy at work. Wrong attitude. It's all about the attitude of the heart. Remember we talked about that in context of open and rebellious, unrepentant sin in the body of Christ? It's all about the heart attitude. If the guy who was sleeping with his stepmother had said, I have, I have sinned, I recognize that it's, I am way far off from God's best, I need your help and your prayers, that would have been a completely different situation. But this guy was like touting his sin. And so Paul said, get that guy out of here, he's a cancer. So, we, the, the important thing is, don't treat marriage like Velcro, which, you know, is easily ripped apart and then easily attached to some other thing over here. That is not the idea at all. Um, and apparently one of the specific situations that Paul was dealing with was that women and men who had come to faith in, in Christ, but their spouses hadn't, they were still um, non-Christians or they'd refused. So they, they were thinking, well, in order to really serve the Lord, we should just get out of this marriage because we're not supposed to be unequally yoked, right? Maybe they already felt single even though they were technically married. And Paul says, oh, not necessarily. Look at verse 12. <clears throat> he says... To the rest I say, to the rest I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she is willing to live with him, he must not leave her. 
Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he is willing to live with her, she must not leave her husband. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the believing wife is sanctified by the Christian husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the believer, unbeliever leaves, let him leave. A brother or sister is not bound in such cases. God has called us to peace. For you, wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband? Or you, husband, how do you know whether you will save your wife? Okay, so let's back up, go through this a little bit. First of all, Paul says... Um, in verse 12, to the rest, I, not the Lord, say. Now, some people might think, okay, uh, it's, it's kind of like, uh, this, is, this is scripture, and now uh, we're going to stop that, and I'm going to give you a little bit of advice. Uh, that's not what he's saying here. He's just saying, Jesus did not have a specific thing to talk about this particular case of people marrying, one of them coming saved, and then the, the, uh, them, them wanting to divorce their spouse because they weren't saved. So this is what I am telling you. It doesn't mean that it has any less force because um, Jesus handed off authority for uh, speaking for him and the term, the technical term is ex cathedra. It literally means from the chair, the chair of authority. Paul was writing with the authority of scripture when he says this. It's just that it's him saying it and there was nothing specific the Lord said. Actually, and I don't want to take too much time on this, but this is an important point. Um, the Bible is actually not a user's manual. You guys ever buy computer programs and you open up the box? At least, at least it used to be this way. Uh, I got, got a, something the other day and I opened it up and all there was was the thing in there uh, that I got. And there was no manual, there was no instruction, there was nothing. I'm going, okay, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this thing? You know, I'm pressing buttons and little things are flipping out all over the place. I'm going, okay, this looks interesting. No user's manual. But you know, it used to be you bought software and it came in a big box like this. And, and there were like five manuals in there and you opened them up and, and it was a user's manual. It told you everything to do from installation to configuration to use and troubleshooting and all this stuff, how-tos. We, we can't treat the Bible like a user's manual. What is the Bible? The Bible is God's story of creation, fall, redemption, and renovation. And it's how He is really the center of the universe and that it's all about Jesus. It's the story of God's salvation for a fallen humanity and how He is redeeming and us and renovating His creation. That's the context with which we have to look at the Bible. It's not a user's manual because it doesn't answer every single specific thing. And if we try to make it that, we turn the Bible into a list of don'ts. And we end up scripture because we're desperately trying to find that little verse that's going to tell us, okay, this is what I do in this situation. Turn left, not right at the light. <laughs> Here's what the Bible is, however. It is a character sketch of this God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that he is creating a new character in us. The prophet Jeremiah said, I will write my laws on their hearts. And as we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, he begins to write his character. He's rewriting the software of our character so that we will think, speak, and act like Jesus. And the more mature you become as a Christian, the more you know his word, the more you give access to the Holy Spirit in your life, the more you will find yourself knowing what to do, not because you're finding it in you know, the, the book of Ecclesiastes, but because you find it in your heart and it matches what we find in Scripture as the character of God. So anyway, I went way more off into that than I meant to. Um, So, Paul is wanting to give some really good advice then to these people who were married to spouses who were non-Christian. And um, they were thinking, I've got to get rid of this guy or this gal because they're, they're a boat anchor for my faith. And Paul is saying, no, they're a mission field for you. That's how you need to look at it. Staying with that unbelieving spouse actually makes it a whole lot more likely that they and 
and your kids will come to faith in Christ than if you divorce them and leave and are out of the situation. Um, and Paul uses the words, you know, sanctify and holy, and, and we think, um, oh, does that mean, you know, that, that our, our husbands or our wives are automatically counted in the kingdom of God and our kids are, you know, automatically Christians? No, that's not what it's, what it's saying here. Um, however, I will, there's a, there's a general belief that um, children,